Alrighty, episode number 13 of You Think You Know Me. Boy, it was a nerve-wracking Daytona Speed Week, if you ask me. First and foremost, let's get this k and news out of the way, because I feel like this needs to be said right now. Coming up March 6th, it will be the premiere of West Coast Wednesday, where I talk about all things k and West. How is everything going? Updates, news and rumors, entry list. And also race highlights is where I will discuss it more than likely the week after the race actually takes place because, you know, tape delays on NBCSN. But first and foremost, the big one that came out was indeed Cody Vanderwall. I mentioned a couple of times that Cody Vanderwall is one of those guys that it was a big unknown because in my eye, Vanderwall is one of the more better drivers in the Canada West as far as what he's able to do with so little. That is Flying Dutchman Racing. He's the only one. From my knowledge, that outside of Will Rogers, that one that is not from Sunri- Sun- Sunrise Ford or Bill McAnally, and also more importantly, any Cup regulars that were to have competed in, or again, also not just that, a can and East drivers. So for Vanderwall getting this big announcement, this is the big announcement from Vanderwall's camp. He will be in the Canada West field once again. He will drive the number 43, but he'll have an alliance with Bottom, with Levin. Levin Racing, that's also the number 10 car that Matt Levin drove last season. The number 10 Chevrolet, you know, the number fun that looks exactly like Jennifer Joe Cobbs. That one. It won't be a number 10. I mentioned it, he, you being the 43. So this is always excellent news when two teams that are regulars that have been trying to do their damnness to work together and seeing if the anything can come out of it. So Vanderwall, no doubt, will be a guy that I would expect him to be in the top five in the championship standings. As you know, the top three from last season don't have a ride. Partridge doesn't have a ride. Cole Rouse doesn't have a ride. Doesn't have a ride. Derek Thorne is going to the late models in the Southwest Tour. So to have at least a couple more regulars that has won before in the K&N West is always a good thing. So we'll see how he does with this new alliance with Fly- with Matt Levin's camp. All right, now everybody's been wondering, how did the Daytona 500 win? How did everything went through Speed Weeks? I mentioned I will do some sort of a vlog format where I go into greater detail how it went. It may take a couple days, may take a couple weeks, who knows? But here's this, I'll put this. There were two red flags. So yeah, that's very pretty obvious as you already saw in my every red flag Daytona 500 video it took me a couple days to put it together because you know if I were to post it there was no time for me to do it the day at the day of the 500 when all those went down because you know I have another gig that's far more important than what I do here second of all I'd rather just wait for about 4 24 48 36 36 hours until the clear is good so we can st- I can put those compilations this would be the case if it, this would have been the case if a red flag were to come out of Homestead. Instead of putting it a em- couple hours after the finale in Homestead, I wait about a day or two. And this was one of those cases where I had to wait a day or two just in case to be in the clear. Once I think NASCAR puts all their clips up, NBC, Fox Sports, then I can start doing all those compilations. It takes a couple days. I'd rather just wait for a few days instead of being instantaneous. And thank goodness there was a case where I needed to wait because there were a couple factual errors that I've noticed, a couple factual grammatical errors that I feel like that needs to be done before it goes up because I don't want to have another Indianapolis 500 ref like video scenario except now that you saw as I'm recording this, I'm recording this the day if the ref like video going up it'll be up on the Thursday the 21st that you're hearing right now now you saw it's more calm and clear, it's consistent, it's well balanced that will be the case for the ref like video of Indianapolis 500 well, how, how did Speed Weeks win? Let's talk about the game, their RB duels. As you know, Joey Gase and Ryan Truex failed to qualify. That meant Brendan Gong, Brendan Gong, and Parker Kligerman made it into the Great American Race. For Kligerman, it's his second 500. For the third straight year, Beer, Beer Motorsports made it. It was outside of Joey Gase and Brendan Gong battling, and Joey Logano making a move to get by Clint Boyer on the last lap. Nothing really happened in the RB duel. Nothing. Of course, it's proven to be the case when it comes to the 500 that more cars, you are able to do more action. A lot more action, a lot of passing, a lot of attempts instead of just running the single file train and blasting Sister of Mercy in the background. 
There's a song called Train by Sisters of Mercy. I just call it the unofficial thing to speed weeks because that's all I can think of is just the word train because that's all the fans were complaining about going into Thursday more so in the NASCAR Racing Experience 300, the Xfinity Series race, which was won by Michael Lynette after 229 attempts. He finally did it in start number 230 in that very same race that Jeremy Clements made his 300 start that apparently nobody knew to notice or bothered to even tweet it unless you saw the decal from afar. Which I did because I have when you have when you're a photographer, you notice those little things and you realize, oh, Jeremy Clemens has been in the sport for a long time in the Xfinity level. He's got one win, of course. That was the big one in Road America when he battled Matt Tiff. But that's besides the point. Kevin Harvick and Joy Logano won the respective duels. So heading into Friday, so that's really much to, to say other than as a writer. You have to accept the fact that sometimes it'll take hours upon hours. But hey, if those hours mean something in the long run, it'll be all worth it. But then Friday came along. Friday was quite rather interesting to say the least because the truck series race, the Next Era Energy Resource 250, was the biggest shit show of all shit shows. Especially in the opening three or four laps where it seems like everybody were wrecking, everybody were cutting tires like Natalie Decker, Brian Doza. Who else? There were so many other trucks involved that it was getting chaotic. I think Robbie Lyons was also another. Then Natalie Decker's were left from blew up and scorched in the flames. She's the last truck winner. Then Dosa ran over a crew member, which fortunately, thank goodness, he came out okay. So he's conscious, awake, and alert. That was the low point of Speedways, that incident with Dosa's crew member. Crew member. And then afterwards, you had Clay Greenfield not able to see a thing. Corey Roper was actually having the best run of, of his life. I was thinking, Cody Ro Corey Roper may win this. Corey Roper, could, if he can hang on, he may have a good shot. Nope. Corey Roper, Corey Roper, excuse me, had a, had a Miguel Paluto with, with, except no massive, no massive air involved when he hit the turn four barrier that used to be known as Calamity Corner. You'll remember the days of Ricky Rudd, Randy LeJoy, among uh, Daryl Waltrip, among others who had, who had hard hits in that Calamity Corner. Add Corey, Corey Roper into the list. Jordan Anderson was also having a tremendous run He in his only super speedway truck, I might add, only to the only to be in a bad spot at a bad time, hit the wall hard. And one photo, it looked very eerie with the truck number in the corner that he hit it. For all I'm going to say, fortunately, there was not another truck next to him. Otherwise, we would probably have a, a lighter version of what happened on February the 18th, 2001. It's, there is a photo out there. So, and due to time constraints and just everything that's bogged down, I won't. there's no photos in this one. Once again, I do apologize because... I just got back from Daytona. It's been a nerve-wracking couple of days. There's so much to discuss, no much, so much to digest. You're getting the lighter version now. Go into greater detail how the experience went itself in another time. Because I like to keep this using, you know me, saying short and to the point as best as possible. And I had to learn that the hard way when it comes to being short and straight to the point. That was a hard hit. And out of the note, and then all of a sudden when it came down to it, it all of a sudden there was only nine trucks left. Yes, there were fewer trucks at the finish than it was in 2000 and 2005. Nine out of 32 finished. And among the nine was Angela Rooch. Who, in previous, her only previous start was in 2010 and Martinsville. She has finished no better than a top 25 in the Xfinity Series. Remember, she's Derek Hope's niece. Twin niece, remember. He was driving for Nemco Motorsports, which people were wondering... Of all drivers, Joe Nemechek picked Angela Rouge. Here's the thing, Angela Rouge does have finances. Here's another thing. Finances sometimes really helps the teams that are actually good. Nemco is a good truck team when the finances are there. Look no further than John Hunter Nemechek and how on multiple occasions there was that concern. Before Brent Moffitt in a Hattori racing, that was John Hunter Nemechek and Nemco as far as sponsorship battles, battles as far as whether or not they'll be at the racetrack every week. For Rouge to get that opportunity, and the simple task was very simple. When I was listening to the scanner, it was all simple. Simple task. Run the bottom, stay in the bottom, no matter what. Then she had a cylinder going down, clutch issues, overheating. There were so many 
six that could have knocked Rouge out of the race and she still was running. Yeah, she had to drop in the far back of the pack that prevented her from probably getting a top five or even win the truck race. And, now at, the, and at the very end, it paid off and she got eight out of the nine trucks that were remaining. Austin Way self, who was involved in that big wreck with Jordan Anderson that took most of the field out, finished ninth. Stuart Friesen runs out the top 10 by in the garage area. That shows you how much the attrition was. But it was a rather interesting race. First two stations, they used their heads, like last year. So the, the testament was proven that the truck series used their heads despite the inexperience. Sure, the opening last was a huge mess for dealing with experience versus inexperience. And that, and that, when it was all said and done, the veterans prevail. And Austin Hill, first race with Hattori Racing, puts the truck in the victory lane right out of the gate. This is the, this was the theme of Daytona. The theme of Daytona is proving the haters wrong by boom out of the gate victories. It's proven with Austin Hill with Hattori, and he's trying to prove that Hattori Racing is actually a really good truck team. Not just because Brad Moffitt made them a good truck team. Austin Hill's out there to prove the, that one, he's got the ride of a lifetime. Two, prove that Hattori Racing are not one hit one. So three, it's not just Moffitt that can make that truck good. Sure, it is Daytona, but it's always a conference booster to win at Daytona regardless, and Austin Hill is in the playoffs. But to no surprise, I'm not surprised that he's, he won. I don't, when I spoke to him in, in an article that you can find on Motorsports Tribune, he pretty much put it out there that he felt confident he could win a race. He, he wasn't sure if he was going to win right away, but he's confident. he was confident enough that he would win eventually. Remember, he went from Young's Motorsports, which, by the way, also another six Spencer Boyd. Got a top five out of that race for Young's Motorsports. So it's a great effort, great effort for that team that Austin Hill drove for a couple years. And which Austin Hill was actually pretty good at. Last year he was 11 the point standings, and now he's going into the rest of the season just, I guess, planning and win more races and be strong to prove his worth. Because I always felt Austin Hill was one of the more better drivers out there that's not from Thor Sport, KBM, DGR, Hattori, or GMS. So that was a great showing for him. And of course, a lot of talk was just strategy because remember, strategy is key. And that's also been the central theme of working together. When it comes to Fords, it was basically just Sword Sport and three other trucks that included Corey Roper from the Ford camp. In the Cup, there was only six Toyotas. Literally, it's just six Toyotas. In Xfinity, it was a little bit more balanced. Which leads me to the Xfinity Series race itself. It was just a pure train show. No major accidents. The only one of no was Ray Black Jr. spinning because that's Ray Black Jr. I mentioned it one time. Got ridiculed by it. Since Brad Sweet went back to the World of Outlaws and became a Knoxville Nationals winner in a really good spring car race. Or dirt one at that. Really good one. Really, really good one. He made himself better than ever. He was already good before him, but he made himself ass better when he came back. That you can guarantee almost 99, 90% of the time if Ray Black's in ball, he, he'll be in a spin and bring out a caution. People thought that was going to be the saving grace. Nope. It was just a train and a train and a train. Nope. The cars were, it basically comes down to the cars in this package. That nobody can make a move. Chase Elliott tried everything he can to make an entertainment car try in the bottom. It just did not work when everybody wanted to go to the top. Jeffrey Earnhardt and Joe Gibbs had a strong showing outside pole. Lem, all but the final lap of stage one, and then from there, he's just couldn't get back to the lead. He had a great show. He will be driving a couple more Xfinity Series races and a couple Cup races in a new team as part of an alliance with Joe Gibbs Racing. So, if Jeffrey and her can make these runs count, ask Proven, look at the other guys that have done them before him. Look at Tyler Reddick, look at Ross Chastain, Sean Hunter Nemechek, Justin Haley for, to a degree. There are so many drivers that have. Boom, these part-timers, Chase Briscoe, another one. So many drivers that were made the most out of part-time, look where they at right now, especially on top-tier equipment. So I hope for the best for Jeff Earnhardt if that same fate happens to him. Because he said it multiple times on record, he wants to earn it the hard way. He doesn't want to be handed the run. He wants to prove that he's to earn it. I think this is a good start for Jeffrey Earnhardt, and I hope he does the same thing with that new team alliance that they had that's kind of similar with Spire Motorsports. But slightly different. Speaking of Spire, James Hinchcliffe is part of a new client agency that is called Dream. 
where he, Joseph Newgarden, Spencer Piggott, and I remember the top of my head, the other one might have been Jack Harvey. So yeah, how much longer until we see that agency become an IndyCar team? We'll see. We'll see. It, it could happen. You never know. You never know. Also, Garrett Smithley will drive at Atlanta in a number 77 car. That is only confirmed by Quinn Huff at the moment. How much longer do we expect until we see Cole Rouse, who is part of the Spire agency, by the way, to make his cup debut? Or at least run some Xfinity. Remember, he's the, he's the free agent in the k and West Tour. But that's a different topic for another time. Michael and Eve went to victory lane. Justin Allgaier for a second. Nobody could make a move. That was very difficult to pass with this car. Everybody wanted to stick to the top. For Annette, this is a sentimental win because, like I said with Austin Hill, people were upset that Moffat got replaced by Austin Hill. And a lot of people were upset that Michael Annette still has a JR Motorsports ride. Here's the thing. It's been six years since he had that horrific wreck at Daytona in turn one that sidelined him to six to eight weeks. He was rare. He was driving for Petty the year before he got a top five in a series championship in 20, 2012. The one that Stan has won the championship, remember? So there's a lot, there's a lot of expectations when you have a strong season and then and then when you have that horrific wreck, it just seems like he's just never been the same. And then at the end of last season, he showed a little bit more promise when Travis Mack le- when Travis Mack became the crew chief for Annette. And look, it's paid off so far. And that gets the win. Annette is going to the playoffs. So yeah, I I don't is they're coming in with more with a new attitude, new sinking process because I've always felt Michael that was one of the more better pay drivers out there. This is where I side with Kamikaze Games because I always felt he was one of the more better ones out there that has the sponsorship to a T and is locked and secure. If I were to say who's better, Allgaier or Annette, of course I'll, pro- I'll go with Allgaier because he's been, he just had Brandt for the longest of time. Remember when he was at Penske, he didn't have Brandt. When he moved, Brandt stuck with him. Look, look no further. Well, during the offseason, he runs he races in South America with Miguel Paluto with the Brandt sponsorship. Michael Annette has, of course, Flying J Pilot. In my opinion, the OG Flying J Pilot is Gary Bradbury. Because because he had it first, you know. But he had a he he held off pretty well. I think this team chemistry is working pretty well. And what I when I was when I was putting the piece together on Annette, how that new confidence is really starting to pay off. I think everyone from that camp, from Travis to Michael Annette to Dale Jr., everybody are in that same boat that this is a different Michael Annette, and this win will make him different than ever. That just brings new confidence. It's good to see Michael in that win. He's proven already. Sure, again, I know it's Daytona, but if he can continue that momentum, then he'll be. He and Austin Hill will have one thing in common. They're proving that they do belong. Austin is given the opportunity of a lifetime. That he's about to show what he's capable of. Michael Annette's story is different because he, he's been given these opportunities. It's just a matter of when he's going to have that 2012 magic again, or even better than 2012. And hopefully that translates to more strong runs in the future over time. Because well, let's be honest, Dale Jr. has mentioned before at Richmond that he like he would like to have Ross Chastain, but he's just he doesn't have he just the money and finance and sponsors may may not be there for him. Like DC Solar was when that's where before the whole fiasco happened. DC Solar believed in Ross that they put him in a full time effort at Ganassi before that whole brouhaha happened. Oh, and by the way, the 42 is now from is now at another team with the Supra of Mr. Jackson himself. So the 42 is still around, but now at a different team and at a different Megan. And it's going to be that's pretty much the only thing re- remaining of the 42 in the Xfinity Series level. Great win for Michael in that. And then the Daytona 500. Right out of the gate, before the race even started, Jim Fress pretty much stated it. I bluntly said it. Jim France said that. Work, try to do the best you can and put on a great show, as proven by Chase Elliott. And also, Danny Hamlin has been very vocal of trying to make that inside line work. Both Hamlin and Elliott were, refer- were referenced in Jim France's opening speech. Jim France was around Daytona. Everybody's seen the photo after the advanced auto parts clutch, which, by the way, had three red flags, a record, that put on a good show. Would I talk about Barstool Sports? No, this is not relevant to me. We both talk about Barstool Sports. It's absolutely not. It's good for them to be a part of the sport. I'm just going to 
me in the backseat just to see how that pans out over time. Like seriously. I don't know, whatever I say that contributed to the rating and people were saying that last year's red flag to made it contributed. But by the way, for the record, there were no red flags in 2018 State Tone of 500. There were none. There were none. If people actually watch my channel, they know and actually pay attention to have an attention span that is strong. They would know that the first red flag of 2018 was at Texas. Good shout out to the people that summed up my comment on the David Land video. And at least David Land said, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section. So, so there's that. That's one thing. If you say something, if somebody says something within those lines, then I'll gladly explain. And I'll gladly say that there were no red flies in 2018. There was in 2017. And of course there were two this year. Then there's others. Uh, some people are probably said that they don't, there were red flies in 2018. It's like, no. No, if you watch my videos, you know there were no red flies in the Daytona 500 last year. All right, that's enough rambling. The 500, it was actually a pretty good race. It was actually a really good race from my perspective. The top lane, the bottom lane, both lines were working. Right out of, there were a lot of teamwork, a lot of team effort, especially teamwork became strategic at the absolute very end when it pertains to two veteran cup drivers one with a championship one is probably one of the best to have never won it to this point but boy casey mears his comeback trail didn't work out too well he was involved in, in an incident i remember it was with parker kligerman and bubba wallace and tyler Ryder were going at it uh, going at it over the radio and then also on twitter with reddick being a savage that's the thing that's it's quite interesting because of course bubba said it Oh, oh, and he, just because he won the Xfinity Series Champions, all of a sudden he, he, he's the hot shit. Kind of like what Tony Stewart said to David Gill and when I went to the Lions, uh, that kid is an idiot. He's, he's won one Bush race and, and now he's a cup driver. That was probably the worst Tony Stewart impression you'll ever hear. That's pretty much within those lines that Bubba was referring to Tyler Reddick. The, oh, the kid is an idiot. He's, he won the Xfinity Series Champions and now all of a sudden he's a cup driver. Remember, Reddick is only running a parts guy, so he's only... For the 500, only the 500 at the moment. He's just focused on the, defending the Xfinity Series Championship in that number two car at RCR. Then the big brouhaha between the Rick Ware cars involving Cody Ware and BJ McLeod and Rory Pitt Road. I just, I knew deep inside of my mind, I was just like, I had that feeling. I had that feeling there might be a Pitt Road incident before a big wreck happens because the first two segments, everybody used their heads. They survived stage two when I'm wrecking. More or less stage one, because ever since the implementation of the playoffs, the first two stages was usually the best, the worst part of the race. And then in the third stage, it was more a little bit more tamer, except you have your little big wreck at the very end. But everybody used their heads, which is refreshing. Because I've been vocal about how drivers are how drivers are that way, when they just cannot wait until the very end. I get you get stage points, but... This quality and quality, quality, quality racing at stake as well. We saw good quality racing, which was really good. Is it one of the best? Is it the best 500 ever? No. Is it one of the more better ones? Absolutely. 2015, 2016 were a little bit better in 2019. 2016 is the last pure Daytona 500 to many people's eyes. Because also, not just because it was the last race where they went from there were no stage racing, but also just start to finish everybody ran used their heads quite well and then on lap 191 everything went to the, the absolute drizzling shits because that's when the big one happens paul menard got in the back of matt benedetto who by the way led the most laps at 49 out of 207 william byron had the great had a really good showing he he did really good technique driving he used blocking really well he was blocking jimmy johnson to keep his lead in his sophomore season, he's doing that. That's really good for the 21-year-old in the number 24 Exalta Chevrolet Camaro CL1. Great showing by William Byron. Also a strong joy by Matt DiBenedetto in that 95 Levine family race. Remember, back in 2011, David Starr drove that 95 car and was a Ford. It's one of the last borderline Starman Park teams, new startups in that era that are still around. Just remember, all those Starman Park teams. Or no longer around like Nemco, Prince, Prism. Albeit Prism is still around, but that's premium motorsports now. So technically, 
There's two teams from that Star Park era that are so primarily around. That's Levine and, of course, Premier Motorsports. And also, there's also front row, but there's usually one car. The others, if the one if one is unsponsored, they park it. The other ones, if they're sponsored, they run it. So there's a, still a couple teams. And let's not forget Jermaine. But I'm talking about teams that were at the tail end of the Stardom Park era that did that technique a little bit. But then afterwards, like the Gen 6, they started to run more regular. But it's good to see DiBenedetto, who, by the way, only led 26-29 career laps total going into the 500. Now he led 49. It's a good sign for him. We'll see how he does at Talladega. But then again, it's the new roofs package, which will debut at Atlanta. You go wide, a big one. There were 21 cars that involved all the full time rookies like Tyler Reddick, Matt Tiff, who, by the way, won in the big leg if you listen through the scanner, which unfortunately Radioactive didn't include. But thank goodness they include the Ryan Blaney $5 bill on the grill. You got to get the scanners on through NASCAR.com. It's a couple bucks a month if you want to listen off the track. I encourage you and I recommend it. Because that's probably what I would do for the rest of the year. That's how I'm able to understand the Angela Rue ordeal. And also, Greg Golding was was hesitant, nervous, and the crew members were telling him to calm down after he got hit, after his rear bumper got destroyed by Justin Haley in the pit road. Led, led to Greg Golding calling Justin Haley a prick and a kid. I'll be here. They're both roughly the same age. Remember, Greg Golding is still relatively super young. Just remember that. So remember that it got a good it got a good re, good reaction on Twitter when I transcribed why Golding said to Haley after the rear bumper got destroyed. But anyways, 21 cars and involved the champion Daytona 500 champions Jimmy Johnson, Ryan Newman, and Austin Dillon. By the way, Johnson that was another wreck for him because the other one he was involved with the Reddick and Rick Ware cars. Brouhaha, where the side of the where you put the fuel got completely destroyed and exposed, and somehow he still ran. And somehow he's continued to still running after that big one. That red flag came out immediately. It was the first Daytona 5 red flag since 2017. The 15th overall since the very first one. Which, by the way, as you remember, the first red flag was 1965. And they had to wait another 30 for another to occur as far as red flags are concerned. Then others involved Martin Truex Jr. Which needs to be noted. Martin Truex Jr. was not a factor of this race at all. He was not a factor. Just, I was looking at the back of my mind. All the games cards are right up there. Even Eric Jones. But Truex was not where to be found. He was in the mid-pack the entire time. He just could not get a run going. Daniel Suarez was also involved. David Reagan. Eric Amarola. Whose car lifted again. Fortunately, there was a car. on. Fortunately, he landed on top of a car instead of the full force of the pavement. Like what happened at Kansas. And, and the one to cushion it was David Reagan. No, Ryan Newman was Ryan Newman was not the one. It was David Reagan this time. Imagine if it was Ryan Newman again. It's like, jeez. Imagine if it were, if that were to, if it was Ryan Newman instead of David Reagan. You hear it from DW. And then they were up. Then Raw Gator and all those people that add all the random crap on there will have to update their videos just to bring the cash. Which, by the way, I don't bring the cash on my channel because that's not my motive. That's not my what I'm about on YouTube because that's not my style. So, yeah, after the red flag, there were more two more wrecks in turn number three. Ryan Priest was an absolute monster, an absolute beast. He went through it Days of Thunder style. Sure, he was involved, but he continued. And he made it through the third one. The third one is more important because that was the second red flag. The 16th overall, the first Daytona 500 time, more than one red flag. Since 2010, and the third overall, the other one was 2003. There's, 2003 were both for rain. 2010 were from track surfaces for the pothole in turn one. 2019 were both wrecks in turn three. So I'll be in whenever the Daytona 500 has another red flag that happens more than once. It's going to be a similar trend or one theme, one commonality. But that one involved, the third one involved Clint Boyer, Chase Elliott, William Byron, who took a couple hard hits, Landon Castle's beautiful Permatex, Chevrolet got destroyed. And all of a sudden, there were 19 cars left in the field. And only at the end, there were only three that were not involved in any form of wreck of any kind. Those were Danny Hamlin, Kyle Busch, and Ross Chastain, who drove all three races. He finished in the top five in a truck race, top 15 in Xfinity, he got himself his first career top 10 in his 37th cup start in the Daytona 500. 
So he's no longer in the no top 10 club that includes the likes of Jeffrey Earnhardt, Timmy Hill, Joey Gase, Cole Witt, Michael Annette, Baxter Price, Bobby Hamilton Jr., David Green, among others that had no top 10s. Also, Jeff Burton. Look at all those names that I just mentioned that had no top 10s yet. Some of them got a couple, got a poll like David Green in 1999 at Homestead in a 45 car. The, the Beverly car, if I remember, that used to be the Tabasco Fiasco car the year before. And, if it, and it wasn't David Green in that 45 car. He was there at the very end because Rich Mickle started the year in the 45. David Green went in the 40. Okay, okay, that's enough. Another red flag, but there comes the strategy. Danny Hamlin did not want to pit. Guy with Bush follow suit, and that's what it ultimately led to. Kind of like team strategy, they assured themselves that the Gibbs cars would finish in the top two or win the Daytona 500, which they were able to do so. And then the whole thing with Michael and Nat, Michael McDowell and Joey Logano, they were arguing each other. It's like, why didn't it work with each other? Why did Michael McDowell work with Kyle Bush instead of Joey Logano? Where Logano felt like, and he worked with him. They would have had a stronger chance of beating Denny Hamlin. Similar when Kyle Busch was so upset with Alex Bowman in the clash in 2017. Where he felt like had he, wor- had he worked with, had Bowman worked with Kyle Busch, they would have been in a better shot of winning than they were, than, than just making the move for themselves. And I think that's kind of how they both came down with Logano and McDowell. That Logano felt like you eliminated yourself of possibly winning the Daytona 500 if you just... By not working with me. And all of a sudden, because of that, Eric Jones, out of nowhere, who was involved in a couple wrecks, def- came back to Daytona after winning the Coke Zero Sugar 400. Wins by, gets third. Denny Hamlin crosses the line at first, Kyle Busch in second. It was a Joe Gibbs Racing 1 2 3 sweep. The second, yes, the second ever time in the history of the Daytona 500 that a team finished 1 2 3. And if you go way back, way, 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 way back in the early 90s, a newspaper predicted that a Toyota would finish 1, 2, 3 in the Daytona 500 before Toyota came into the sport in 2007 in the Cup Series. So two things happened that were kind of eerie and ironic. Unless, oh, by the way, the reason why I mentioned second in emphasis because there's this one reporter that does primarily IndyCar and no, pretty much know him just to be the IndyCar guy until this week, said they were the first team in Cobb which had to correct them. And I'm just only going to keep it at that because this is not more of a shoot format like I would do in other episodes because I just want to get my thoughts about the 500 and summarize it to you guys. So yeah, Danny Hamlin did it for J.D. Gibbs. It's a Joe Gibbs sweep. Everybody went to stake and shake from the 11 camp. And to sum it all up, Austin Hill proved the haters that he belo- he's ready to prove his worth in a top team. Michael Annette proved the haters wrong that he belongs with the team. Danny Hamlin proved the haters that he is still a competitive driver and and albeit and the reason why because everybody say Christopher Bell Christopher Bell Christopher Bell is going to be the next driver here's the thing about Christopher Bell if he doesn't get the Gibbs ride I do see him going to Ganassi he's going to be a Chevy more than likely I see him being a Ganassi guy and if Noah Gregson does not pan out Kyle Larson decides to go to Hendrick and be Johnson's successor then Bell can jump in, but then it's also Ross Chastain. This is a confusing puzzle within Christopher Bell where I see him being a coach. A second Levine car? Who knows? Christopher Bell will be in Cup. I see him at the very least in 2020 be in the Cup Series. I don't think they're going to waste him too long in the Xfinity because otherwise he's probably going to have 40 wins in 20 and by the end by 2021 and the Xfinity level. But any Amlin improved. And I said, I, in my mind, it's like if there was one guy I had to pick to win the 500, I just felt like Denny Hamlin would be the one. Denny Hamlin finished third in the Daytona 500 in 2018. He won in 16. It's just, to me, Hamlin just made sense. It felt right to pick him. I just felt like, it's why should not be a Ford? If it's not a Ford, it's going to be Hamlin. And I, that's why I ultimately went with Hamlin to pick to be the Daytona 500 winner. It's a great, it's a great sentimental win. It's a great sentimental win, no doubt about it. It was a quite an interesting and quite weird Speed Week 2019. When you look back at it, that's how I'll feel about it. And that's the bottom line because I said so. <laughs> all right, that will do with this episode of You Think You Know. But that's just all my quick thoughts and how I felt and what went down during Speed Weeks for the trucks, Xfinity, the 500 itself, and of course the duels. In the next video, hopefully 
if time permits, I will discuss it in great detail how I felt being here at Daytona. I had this idea to make it a vlog, vlog format where I discuss and reflect. It kind of worked out. I kind of didn't work out, but I'll do the best damn thing possible to make it explainable for you. So, yeah, March 6th will be the debut of West Coast Wednesdays. And the NBC TV graphics is still to be determined, which I will hopefully discuss in another topic of why that series could be in jeopardy. And I'm probably sure you, some of you already know if you've watched Kamikaze Games' this video about the subject matter as to why I feel like the TV graphics series is a little bit in jeopardy. But for now, until we meet again, I hope you guys enjoy me discussing as best as I can in a quickly timely manner. It's well over 30 minutes. I apologize yet again, but hey, it is what it is. It's my podcast format. Anything goes. So in the meantime, I'll catch you guys later.